This presentation uh, is a little bit of a deep dive into the narcotic farm, uh, specifically around the origins and influences it had upon 12-step mutual aid uh, for individuals with addiction. There's a couple of acknowledgements that I'd like to make. Uh, none of this work would be possible without the collaboration of Boyd Pickard and Bill White, um, who we've been working together for uh, since 2008 um, on a history of mutual aid recovery fellowships for individuals with addiction. And so um, this work would not be possible without their contributions. There's also many other people uh, who have been uh, amateur historians uh, in the history of addiction recovery mutual aid uh, who have played really critical roles in um, paving a path for uh, the research that uh, Boyd and Bill and I have been able to do. I'd also like to acknowledge the Northern California History Project. Um, this is a, a group focused on the history of Narcotics Anonymous in Northern California, and they've contributed a photo that's new to this presentation. The goals of this presentation are to describe the history of the narcotic farms uh, in greater depth than done in the early story presentation. Also to explore the undertold story of Addicts Anonymous, which was an institutional-based addiction recovery mutual aid group for individuals addicted to drugs other than alcohol that was started at the narcotic farm in Lexington, Kentucky. And then the third thing is to examine the influence of Addicts Anonymous on community-based addiction recovery uh, mutual aid groups. This is a quote we've been using in some of our presentations by Cicely Tyson that says, when you know your history, you know your value. You know the price that has been paid for you to be here. You recognize what those who came before you built and sacrificed for you to inhabit the space in which you dwell. And this is just a really uh, beautiful quote that summarizes, I think, a lot of why looking at history and, and recognizing the contributions of those um, who made sacrifices and were of service made for the benefit of us today, and to think of those who are doing the same thing today for the benefit of those tomorrow. So next few slides are in the early story presentation, but uh, a very significant piece of federal legislation um, that was kind of a benchmark or a milepost in leading to what would become the narcotic farms is the passage of the Harrison Act, 1914. Uh, it used registration and taxation to restrict the use of opiates and cocaine to legitimate, legitimate medical purposes, which previously you could get through mail order catalogs, through a pharmacy. Um, and America essentially went from uncontrolled access to access regulated by physicians. This was originally designed as a revenue bill, but the Treasury Department began to require that physicians' prescriptions to individuals who were addicted to opiates had to specify progressively decreasing doses, number of physicians um, did not think about uh, that that was the best course of action for those that they had been serving and continued to prescribe um, opiates to individuals. There were some court cases and, a, and eventually a Supreme Court ruling that said it was a violation of the Harrison Act for a physician to prescribe morphine to an addict for purposes other than attempting to cure the habit. So there's this period of time kind of between 1918 and 1938, where more than 25,000 physicians are indicted under the Harrison Act, 3,000 physicians went to jail, 20,000 paid substantial fines, and physicians stopped treating individuals who were addicted. Uh, there was just too much risk and liability. So what the narcotic, uh, the Harrison Act did for the narcotic farm, uh, or to kind of lead to the narcotic farm, was it criminalized addiction um, you know, in the 1914, really kind of going up until 1929 that we're looking at right now. And during this, this period of time, this initial kind of 15 years of the Harrison Act, there was a drastic increase in the number of addicts being incarcerated in federal prisons, with some estimates about a third of all inmates uh, were now uh, individuals with addiction. And wardens were encountering problems managing the prisons with, quote, this new type of criminal. In 1928, the superintendent of prisons recommended the establishment of federal institutions for narcotic treatment and rehabilitation, and Pennsylvania Congressman Stephen Porter introduced a bill that would establish two narcotic farms. Now, in a book 
called Dark Paradise that was published in 1982, David Courtright provides some insights as to what was happening during the congressional hearings that led to the establishment of the narcotic farms. Quote, the theme that addicts were dangerous and compulsive individuals inclined to commit crimes and spread addiction also dominated the 1928 con congressional hearings on the establishment of two federal narcotic farms, which eventually, eventually became the Lexington and Fort Worth hospitals. Although they would accept some volunteer patients, the narcotic farms were conceived primarily as specialized pr prisons to siphon off the overflow of addicts from other federal penitentiaries. Wardens testified that their facilities were already badly overcrowded and the addicts were troublesome prisoners constantly plotting to smuggle in drugs. They expressed fears that some of these drugs would find their way into the hands of non-addicted inmates, worsening the narcotic problem. The solution was therefore to put all the bad apples into two capacious new barrels. So in 1929, U.S. Congress authorized the U.S. Public Health Service to establish two narcotic farms, quote, for the treatment or the confinement and treatment of persons addicted to the use of habit forming narcotic drugs. This is some early press coverage. Uh, this is March 4th, 1935, public enlightenment, uh, you know, describing victims of drug addiction and showing them going to the new federal narcotic farm. And so it's May 28th that the first of two uh, narcotic farms open, and this opens in Lexington, Kentucky. In 1938, a separate one will open in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Um, for this presentation, uh, we focus really solely on uh, the narcotic farm in Lexington because of its role. Now, to go there, um, you had to um, use, quote, narcotic drugs specified to, by federal law. And narcotic drugs was a broad category under, under federal law that included more than opioids. So you had uh, cocaine, cocoa leaves, codeine, Dilaudid, heroin, marijuana, uh, even things like peyote um, that were defined under federal law as narcotic drugs. Now, people who were habitual users of alcohol, amphetamine, um, some bar barbiturates uh, were not eligible um, for uh, services at either of the narcotic farms. And again, there's two ways that you could go there. You could go there as a volunteer, or you could also be sentenced there. So this is um, an application for voluntary admission to the U.S. Public Service uh, Health Service Hospital. And it's got some questions on here, such as the name of the drug that you're addicted to, the average dose, and how often it is taken. And it's got questions in here. Uh, in section 12 uh, about whether you'd previously been hospitalized at either Lexington and Fort Worth, what those dates were. And then what's very kind of interesting is this uh, question about were you discharged as cured? Yes or no. And cured is really kind of the uh, terminology to describe what the intention and purpose was, was to cure people of their uh, addiction. Um, it also speaks to the understanding of addiction at that time, which has certainly changed uh, to be thought more of as kind of a chronic condition and not something that is necessarily necessarily curable. Um, and on here, it, on the back side of this form, like one thing to highlight, it says, you must understand that since you assigned an application for voluntary admission to a United States Public Health Service hospital, you have uh, pliedly agreed to submit to confinement for the period estimated by the Surgeon General of the United States. Public health service is necessary to effect a cure or until you are cured. One year is the maximum time estimated as necessary to effect a cure in the average case. And once Fort Worth opened in 1938, men uh, west of the Mississippi went to Fort Worth, Mississippi River, and men east of the Mississippi River went to Lexington, and then women uh, from wherever in the United States went to Lexington. Uh, there would be um, medical certification of drug addiction. Um, you know, I certify that I believe this is such person is, is not an addict. There were uh, pre-admission reports of drug addiction in convicted persons. 
Um, and then kind of interestingly on, on the backside of this form, you know, it says that, you know, the reporting officer and purpose of report in the case of a convicted person who has been sentenced or placed on probation and who apparently is an addict, the certif certificate must be executed by the prosecuting officer or the probation officer. The certificate in such cases is a requirement of regulations approved by the Secretary of the Treasury. The status of convicted persons, insert information showing whether a convicted person was sentenced to confinement or placed on probation, and then the definition of, quote, addict and, quote, habit-forming narcotic drugs. The law authorizing the establishment of the United States narcotic farms defines the terms addict and habit-forming narcotic drugs as follows. Quote, the term addict means any person who habitually uses any habit-forming narcotic drug as defined in this act so as to endanger the public morals, health, safety, or welfare, or who is or has been so far addicted to the use of such habit-forming narcotic drugs as to have lost the power of self-control with reference to his addiction. So there was definitely uh, categories and parameters around who could go there. And again, it was both a hospital and a prison with people sentenced there for federal violations of the Harrison Act, as well as people who may have been probated there or who went there as volunteers. 12-step recovery for addicts. Lexington will become ground zero for the transmission of the Alcoholics Anonymous program to drug addicts. And this happens with an individual by the name of Dr. Tom M., who had been a physician from Shelby, North Carolina, uh, who had been uh, addicted to alcohol before developing a 12-year addiction to morphine. And he goes uh, to the narcotic farm in Lexington in 1939 to, quote, take the cure. And one of the earliest uh, known recordings of Bill W., co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, he recounts visiting Shelby, North Carolina around 1942, and he does a good job of kind of describing what uh, Dr. Tom's experience was. And this is important from the standpoint of um, the undertold story of what uh, the narcotic farm uh, did, which is it served um, not from the institution necessarily, or from the policies and practices implemented, but from uh, exposure to uh, other sources of, you know, early emerging recovery that actually did a lot to help transform uh, countless lives. Speaking of Southern hospitality, it reminds me of one of the greatest stories ever to come out of Alcoholics Anonymous. One day, our central office in New York received a letter from a man who was an inmate of the Lexington place for drug addicts. And he went on to tell us in the letter how he had been a uh, physician, had got onto alcohol, and then on a morphine. And that while there in the asylum, Someone had written him about AA, and he had been reading this AA book of ours. And he said, of course, I used to be an alcoholic, but now I'm an addict of some 12 years standing. But I do see hope for me in this philosophy of yours. And when I get out of here, I'm certainly going to try it. Well, subsequently, our office struck up a correspondence with him. Little by little, he began to describe the formation of an AA group in Shelby. And he turned out to be a delightful, soft-spoken little man, who I shall call Dr. Tom. I found that uh, Tom was rather reluctant to talk about what he had done in Shelby. So there wasn't much AA shop talk at the table, practically unheard of elsewhere. And I wondered myself if dope had a, a humbling effect. If so, I think that some of us alcoholics should have taken more of it. <laughs> but the crux of my story turned around what happened the following morning. 
Somebody called up from the lobby and said, Do you mind, Bill? I'd like to drop up and tell you a few things about Dr. Tom. Do you realize that when that man came back here to this little town, can you possibly comprehend what the stigma was upon him? The stigma of both alcohol and morphine. People were so afraid that they hardly spoke to him on the street. And he said, I am sorry to say that even the drunks of Shelby were snobbish, saying that they weren't going to be sobered up by no damn drug addict. Well, little by little, he started to work, and little by little, he began to succeed. Tom now has been made the head of our local hospital. He probably has the largest medical practice in this county today. All of this accomplished in three years from a start way behind the line. And we have a yearly custom in this town in which all of its citizens take a vote on which one of them has been the most in useful individual to the community in the year past. And last spring, Dr. Tom was almost unanimously nominated as the most useful citizen of the town of Shelby. So it's in 1943, uh, according to his obituary, that he was Shelby's man of the year by the, the Lions Club. In 1944, which predated this uh, talk that Bill gave, uh, Bill wrote about this, or it was a transcript of a talk that he gave at the Yale Summer School of Alcohol Studies, and described uh, how they were very skeptical of uh, his offer to start meetings in um, Shelby. Quote, the very idea of a narcotic addict starting an AA group, even if he had once been an alcoholic, and here he was going to try to start it in a little southern town in the midst of all this local pride and gossip. Um, there's another presentation on uh, this YouTube channel that uh, talks about problems other than alcohol. Um, and throughout this presentation, I'll just kind of point out, uh, without going into too much detail, uh, some of those tensions that Bill struggled with, like the idea of a narcotic addict uh, starting an AA group. This is Dr. Tom, 1961. He's the first known person to achieve sustained recovery from addiction to drugs in addition to alcohol through Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's a very significant um, accomplishment and kind of proof of concept in some ways that what was working for alcoholics could work for people who at this point were, in Dr. Tom's case, had the dual problem of alcohol and morphine addiction. In 1944, uh, AA starts publishing a monthly uh, journal called The Grapevine. Um, this is where uh, addicts in AA first recognize their mutual presence. So this is how they're discovering one another. And just the third issue of the grapevine in August 1944, Doc N submits a letter suggesting a hopheads corner. And essentially what he's saying here is that he's finding freedom in AA from narcotics um, and that he'd like a hopheads corner in the grapevine. Uh, and he says, after all, we do have a particular problem, even if mine is essentially the same problem of all alcoholics. I occasionally could wish that there were just one other narcotic victim in my AA group with whom I might share experiences. And though through the help of the higher power and my AA friends, I no longer take morphine, I realize I fear it in a way I've ceased fearing alcohol. If I could just share experiences with some other hophead, I know it would be a big help, but among AA's thousands, I'm sure I'll find my fellow sincerely doc in. So there's a, a issue of identification and shared under mutual understanding, and he's having trouble finding that amongst individuals who are, quote, straight alcoholics in his group and looking for somebody who can also understand uh, the obsession that he's experienced with uh, uh, narcotics. In the very next issue in September of 1944, Dr. Tom from Shelby responds, and this response sheds a lot of insight into things that are 
uh, working, uh, some of the mechanisms and characteristics of the group that are contributing to their success. He says, we have in our club five men who have had many years of drug addiction, but who are finding complete freedom from drugs and are well on the highway to successful and happy living. So off the bat, you, you can see that he's solved or resolved one of the issues that um, Doc N is talking about. You know, there's identification that can happen in this this group because there's people who have that experience. He says their period of freedom varies from five months to six years. Um, and says these men, with one exception, were all primary alcoholics. And I believe this is largely true of all hopheads, which is important from the standpoint of the this concept during this time of the dual problem member, the person with an alcohol history and a narcotic history versus the straight addict or the straight alcoholic. He goes on to say that he's sure that other AA groups have men who are finding the new life of freedom, and he earnestly wished that we may get into communication. And real importantly, he suggests the possibility sometime of interesting the U.S. Public Health Service in the establishment of an AA group in, in the narcotic farm in Lexington. So, um, so this is, you know, Dr. Tom kind of saying, you know, the AA program uh, would be applied very well to uh, individuals uh, at the narcotic farm. And so a, a significant kind of his event, you know, this is from the early story in the history of NA, is this, this guy, Houston S. gets sober. And so broadly, what we could say is that this is a significant event in the history of a, uh, addiction recovery mutual aid for individuals addicted to drugs other than alcohol. And so Houston gets sober in Montgomery, Alabama in um, June of 1944, and he meets a man named Harry. This is recounted in the Saturday Evening Post article um, from August of 1954. And Harry's a, a dual problem member, meaning he's got a history of alcohol and morphine addiction. Harry had spent 27 months at Lexington. He stopped drinking, but he had trouble staying, staying clean. And in September of 46, Houston's job transfers him to Frankfort, Kentucky, which is near Lexington. And remembering his friend, Harry, Houston approaches Dr. Victor Vogel about starting a 12-step group uh, there. And Dr. Vogel was the medical director for the narcotic farm at the time. And in the Saturday Evening Post, you know, it, it says, you know, Houston says, Harry's troubles kept jumping through my brain. Quote, I was convinced that the 12 suggested steps would work as well for drugs as for alcohol if conscientiously applied. One day I called on Dr. V.H. Vogel, the medical officer then in charge at Lexington. I told him of our work with uh, Harry and offered to assist in starting a group in the hospital. Dr. Vogel accepted the offer and on February 16, 1947, the first meeting was held. Weekly meetings have been going on ever since. So this is a very kind of significant event is this, uh, the first adaptation of Alcoholics Anonymous it occurs in 1947 under the name Addicts Anonymous, basically using the AA program. And, it, and it's a result of Houston's initiative to approach the narcotic farm and Dr. Vogel and inquire about doing something to bring aid uh, to the people that are there. Uh, just of a side note, uh, AA's institutional work, AA's origins are deeply rooted in carrying a message of recovery to those in, in the hospital and see that with Towns Hospital and see that in Akron, uh, with Dr. Bob, a number three is, you know, in the hospital visited by Bill and Bob. And by 1942, AA is taking root in the San Quentin prison. However, it isn't until 1951 that AA creates a service structure and holds its first general service conference. And it isn't until 1954 that they actually have a conference institutions committee. Uh, so a lot of this work and kind of like the initiative on Houston's part and others at that time, um, it's hard to say how coordinated that was and where they were getting their inspiration or guidance from, because it wasn't part of any formal service structure. Uh, certainly not at 1947 when, when Houston did this. This is an individual named Dr. John M., who's from Statesboro, Georgia, since passed. He went to the narcotic farm as a volunteer and then was later probated there. And through some of his uh, AA talks, we've been able to learn about his experience uh, with Addicts Anonymous, his experience with Houston, and his experience with the Addicts Anonymous publication, The Key. We'll listen to Dr. John. 
I knew I was in trouble, and I knew I had to stay there. So I went to the doctors and said, I've got to have him. They told me, after three hours of interviews, that they would give me a full psychoanalysis, and they said, that's what you need. Because in the fix your mind's in, you're not going to get well unless you have it. Providing you'll stay until it's over. They said, the longest we can keep you on this probated sentence is about five months. But uh, if you will stay till we finish this analysis, we will start it. I said, how long? They said, one, two, three years. We don't know. Well, I had a little break of honesty then, I think, because I knew that when I got to feeling better, when the blood got to circulating and I got the old mind working a little bit where I could think up excuses a little bit, I wasn't even making excuses at that time, that I'd find some reason to come out of there. And so I turned it down. And this guy said, brother, if you won't take our psychotherapy, your next best bet is AA and you better go. So what's interesting about this is um, it kind of speaks to uh, the framework of folks in the narcotic farm. And, uh, and it's not uncommon in other settings, different eras of the kind of professional, you know, putting forth this is our kind of current practice and it's the best thing that we have to offer. And, you know, when Dr. John had that insight that he wouldn't stay for the whole time, you know, it was a little bit of an afterthought, but it was fortunate that um, the doctor said, you know, that your next best bet is going to be uh, Addicts Anonymous, which is what the AA stands for there at the narcotic farm. Um, and, and that led uh, Dr. John to lifelong recovery. Um, whereas if he had taken that psychotherapy or what the doctors were saying was the best thing to offer, um, he probably wouldn't have gotten as established. Now, maybe it's possible he would have done both, but just in the way that he recounts that it's, um, you know, it emphasizes and illustrates for me again, that Addicts Anonymous was kind of uh, a secondary thought often overlooked and untold story of the narcotic farm. So I went out there to AA, which has, at that time anyway was Addicts Anonymous. I met one of the most significant people in my life, Houston S. from Frankfurt. He became my first sponsor. And I couldn't understand Houston, because Houston was rich. He had a big, pretty automobile, and he had uh, houses in Florida and the mountains. He could have gone anywhere. But he used to spend his time out there at Lexington, sitting around talking to us, telling us what a sorry old fuck he was. He'd been sober 17 years. And I said, this is strange. And he said he was happy, and this was his life, and this is what he wanted to be. And he started talking about the program, and he was the personification of the AA program, and I let on to it. So this, this is, again, just uh, being included for the importance of adding some uh, context and character to Hugh Houston was and his influence uh, in the words of people who knew him. And again, kind of speaking to really this, this value of mutual aid that AA had discovered and that it was working for people addicted to drugs other than alcohol. Addicts Anonymous group will lead to addicts integrating into AA groups upon their release from the narcotic farm. It will result in the formation of 12-step groups in the community for addicts, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, Drug Addicts Anonymous, Addicts Anonymous groups, even one called Nortrol at the Lorton Institution Penitentiary in, in Virginia. It also serves as a resource for AA's general service headquarters uh, when they would receive uh, addict inquiries about Alcoholics Anonymous and would help connect and spread ideas about recovery being possible. And these ideas were important not only for the individual with addiction, but for the larger community as well, and can be seen um, in you know, congressional testimony in the 1950s around kind of what to do about the, the drug problem. So to start off, we'll focus on Addicts Anonymous's literature. And so in April of 1949, shortly after, you know, two years after they started, uh, they create a publication called Our Way of Life. And uh, we of Addicts Anonymous have rewritten the pamphlet A Way of Life, which is published by Alcoholics Anonymous in order to make it more helpful, we hope, to those addicted to narcotics other than alcohol. So they go in and they just make some changes, um, you know, around terminology and so forth. And they're adapting existing literature as opposed to kind of creating new literature. And they base it on this um, A Way of Life, which is published by a, a group, the Five Points Group in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, 
not much is known about the origins of this publication date, but obviously it predates 1949. Addicts Anonymous influences 12-step fellowships. Um, I'll talk more about the key, but in their publication, the key in, in 1953, they talk about groups um, existing in New York with Narcotics Anonymous in Chicago with Drug Addicts Anonymous and in Los Angeles with the HFD groups of AA, which is the Habit Forming Drug Groups of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what they're saying in here is that, you know, those attending the Addicts Anonymous group, um, you know, are frequently discussing concerns about the treatment accorded to addicts after they leave narco and approach an outside AA group and the hope of being accepted and thereby continuing to live the AA way of life. And this is, they're saying that this is a problem because there's only these groups in a few places in New York and Chicago and Los Angeles. And so if they don't reside there. They're going to have to try to integrate into Alcoholics Anonymous. And the treatment given the addict by outside AA groups ranges all the way from happy acceptance, usual thing, to the utter, to utter rejection by a few groups. Members of Addicts Anonymous, upon release from the narcotic form, uh, farm, form these distinct 12-step groups for addicts. Uh, in the community, and the earliest known uh, one there is the Narcotics Anonymous, which is referred to um, by Boyd and I as kind of the early New York version, uh, and Drug Addicts Anonymous in, in Chicago. It just started in the early 50s by people who'd been involved with the Addicts Anonymous group when they were at the narcotic farm in Lexington. And then kind of a blended model, you have Betty T, who was a member of Addicts Anonymous when she was at the narcotics farm, who would later form a special group of Alcoholics Anonymous called the Habit Forming Drugs Group of, of AA. Addicts Anonymous through literature, newsletter, and other 12 steps group will also influence today's Narcotics Anonymous that exists. The early New York NA, Danny C is among the first patients admitted to the narcotic farm. In 1948, he begin att begins attending the Addicts Anonymous meetings during his seventh admission at Lexington. And in 1948, upon his discharge, he begins attending Alcoholics Anonymous meetings in New York City. Also in 1948, he returns to Lexington for his eighth and final admission. And in April of 1949, Danny returns to New York and sometime that year starts the first non-institution community-based 12-step group for addicts. They also uh, adapt Addicts Anonymous's Our Way of Life into um, a publication that they add, Our Way of Life, an introduction to NA, under the name Narcotics Anonymous. We know that by February 51, it's published because the American Journal of Public Health has announced it. And again, this is based off Addicts Anonymous's Our Way of Life, which is based off AA's A Way of Life. They do... Um, uh, kind of reword step one uh, and make it, we admitted we're powerless over drugs as, as opposed to powerless over alcohol. Now, part of this is showing a lot of the influences and uh, how ideas and efforts were discovered, shared and known about. So early New York NA and Jimmy K, who is one of the founders uh, of uh, today's Narcotics Anonymous. Um, there was an interview uh, where Gene H, who uh, passed in 2015 with 53 years of recovery, was interviewing Jimmy, who passed in 1985, actually, two days from now. Uh, and Jimmy passed with 35 years of recovery. In this August 27th, 1984 interview of Jimmy by Gene, Jimmy reports that he had written to Danny prior to 1952. And Jimmy says he had lost Danny's reply and said to Dorothy S., I'm going to have to write to him again. And then Dorothy says, I just wrote him and I got a letter back. So we see evidence from this interview that there was correspondence and that before the 1953 date of today's Narcotics Anonymous, that, that Jimmy and others were reaching out and trying to learn about it. And this, re this reply that uh, Dorothy got is dated January 2nd. Uh, 1952. So we we know that the writing had to have occurred at some point before that, which would at least be late 1951. And in this, um, Danny responds and says, unfortunately, we're temporarily out of the booklet, Our Way of Life, but additional copies are being printed and will be in our hands in about a week. If you still want a copy, let us know. But please include postage. We have no funds and find it difficult to meet the many requests for material. So this is 
whether a copy of Our Way of Life ever made it out to Jimmy or other members of AA in North Hollywood and uh, the surrounding areas in San Fernando Valley, uh, unsure. But we know that there was uh, communication about this and awareness of this. One of the things that early New York NA did was placed in the, to the national consciousness an alternative belief. And I've used uh, a line uh, quoting Jimmy uh, where he would say, once an addict, always an addict. So um, that was a, a big contribution that early New York NA made early New York NA influenced by Addicts Anonymous. Uh, early New York NA, uh, without a foundation, the 12 traditions or identified successor eventually folds by 1972, following the death of Ray L, who took over for Danny when he passed in 1956. To introduce Betty T with that habit-forming drug uh, group, she intersects with Addicts Anonymous at the Narcotic Farm. She intersects with Danny, early New York NA. She intersects with early attempts in, uh, in Southern California um, and with uh, today's NA. She was addicted to narcotics and alcohol and benzodrine, and she gets sober in, on December 11th, 1949. She left the narcotic farm in 1950, and when she returned, she became active in Alcoholics Anonymous. But by 51, she decides to start a special closed meeting in her home for AA members who had the dual problem of alcohol and other drug addiction. And uh, this will be uh, kind of a source of contention. It's explored in, in thorough detail in the presentation problems other than alcohol about, you know, whether AA could be um, a fellowship for those who are non-alcoholics, so the straight addict and so forth. Um, we know that, you know, that she's had correspondence with Danny C. of the early New York N.A., she doesn't agree with his approach or his a practice of setting up a separate fellowship from alcoholics. Um, and then, you know, by 52, uh, a common thing that Bill inquires about as he's trying to kind of resolve this problem of uh, the narcotic addict and so forth is recommending to Betty saying, eventually you should be able to set up a narcotic organization quite separate from AA. In fact, they have a couple out this way, one being called Narcotics Anonymous and the other Addicts Anonymous. And this is something Bill comes back to um, in other conversations and communications. Um, Betty, again, really doesn't uh, agree with this. Um, she says AA will not accept Addicts Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous is out of the question for me because Danny uh, did not maintain anonymity at the level of press. Um, some of Betty's practices and her descriptions of things uh, speak to some of the issues. She says in 1953 in the key that it is getting to be common for a speaker at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting to say, I want to tell you the story of my alcoholism and my addiction. Um, in 54, Bill is still kind of inquiring, hoping that there is progress with other groups that can uh, serve addicts. What can you tell me of the progress of those groups, which at Lexington and here in the East go under the names Addicts Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous? Uh, Betty describes Houston as a dear friend and a correspondent. So again, we're seeing all these uh, kind of intersections. She's also saying that she's having success of getting addicts into AA meetings and no one seems to oppose them because they're truthful in admitting that they are powerless over alcohol. Um, she's saying that the addict is one of us, many older members of AA that never told of the problem of drugs or openly, openly speaking of it at the meetings. And one like legitimate and really valid point that Betty had and why she saw the need for this is that during this time, uh, there were kind of emerging sense of concern about members of AA with sedatives and narcotics and publications in 1948 on this and publication 1952 kind of exploring this and what is the boundary of sobriety and you know seeing people who are stopped drinking but are still impaired because of their addiction to uh, to a pill we see that uh Betty says that there's Addicts Anonymous groups and Narcotics Anonymous groups in Southern California. So again, we're seeing the influence, uh, not just with early New York NA, but of groups starting that are influenced by uh, the Addicts Anonymous group uh, in Lexington. Uh, 
she also again kind of talks about the results being confusing and her insistence on um, you know keeping her recovery in AA. And then moving forward a few years, uh, her husband Larry, who's also uh, a member of AA and a member of the Habit Forming Drugs Group, just she talks about uh, Doris and Frank, um, and Doris and Frank and Cy, who she referenced here. Uh, these are three people that, along with Jimmy, were part of the founding of today's Narcotics Anonymous. And uh, Larry's writing to Bill W. Uh, saying that they used to attend our habit forming uh, drug AA meetings um, and so forth. And this is the nice contribution from the Northern California History Project um, this photo of, of Larry and, and his wife Betty, who were certainly very influential. In, um, carrying a message to uh, individuals addicted to drugs other than alcohol, uh, as well as she did a lot of work uh, for folks who were uh, in prison. So fellowship, 12-step uh, fellowships and newsletters. Um, so the key is this publication that the Addicts Anonymous group um, created. And in the Saturday Evening Post article in 1954, they say that the group mails a monthly newsletter, the key, free to those who want it, currently a list of 500 names. Many of these are interested but non-addicted friends. Most are mail order members of the group, addicts who have left the hospital and been without drugs for periods ranging from a few weeks to several, several years. So what's very interesting about this is again, this, this newsletter is not going just to former uh, Addicts Anonymous members at the narcotic farm, but also to people in the community, many who are non-addicted. And so this is a vehicle for helping to uh, create a different narrative and vision for the experience of individuals who are addicted. Again, the belief at this time was that there was nothing that you could do to help an addict and that people couldn't get into recovery who had addiction. This helped kind of change that, spread ideas and so forth. We'll listen to Dr. John discuss the key. It seemed like they were cramming AA in me because they made me editor of a little paper, that, little AA paper that they put out at the collection and called The Key. And this was my job while I was there, was working AA. I had nothing but AA 24 hours a day. See, when you got a guy like I am, it's stupid. With all this egotism and this pride, it's got to come in a big dose or you won't get it. And I think God knew that, and I think why he, why he had these people literally cramming this thing into me, because I did not reach out for it. It was pushed upon me, thank God. We know that the key was published weekly at one point, then monthly, and then quarterly. And I think we've probably identified somewhere between 22 and 24 issues of the key, and we just know and believe that there's got to be more out there with the number that they uh, published. But he talked about our purpose. Um, uh, and you saw in the beginning part of the key on the inside, but each each issue of the key had this stated purpose. And again, the influence of this is significant for today's Narcotics Anonymous. At the fifth committee meeting of the seven meetings that would lead to the formation of today's Narcotics Anonymous, this is August 31st, 1953, says our purpose has been taken from the key. At their September 20th, first meeting, which was the seventh committee meeting, they said that uh, Gilda voted and accepted to print our purpose and to contact all newspapers. And so they're using the our purpose from the Addicts Anonymous publication, The Key, to advertise what Narcotics Anonymous is, is going to be, this new uh, fellowship that's starting in Southern California. And Jimmy recounts, you know, he reads our purpose as he's recounting uh, the, the form the formation or that first meeting. This is from the 20th anniversary in 1973. And, you know, he's reading what this uh, announcement was that was used um, that included the Addicts Anonymous, our purpose. And it says here, Narcotics Anonymous, our purpose. This is an informal group of drug addicts banded together to help one another renew their strength in remaining free of drug addiction. Our precepts are patterned after those of Alcoholics Anonymous, to which all credit is given and precedence is acknowledged. We claim no originality, but since we believe that the causes of alcoholism and addiction are basically the same, 
We wish to apply to our lives the truths and principles which have benefited so many otherwise helpless individuals. We believe that by so doing, we may regain and maintain our health and our sanity. It shall be the purpose of this group to endeavor to foster a means of rehabilitation for the addict and to carry a message of hope for the future to those who have become enslaved by the use of habit-forming drugs. Starting Monday night, October the 5th, 1953, each Monday thereafter, at 8.30 p.m., corner of Cantara and Clybourne, Sun Valley, California. So this is what they put together. So again, really kind of borrowing wholesale from Addicts Anonymous to communicate to the public uh, the creation of Narcotics Anonymous. We also see after this in a letter from Jimmy's son uh, that uh, his son Jim writes and says, how's your Addicts Anonymous group going along? Um, I thought you had a pretty good start from what I saw. Uh, so again, uh, influence of uh, Addicts Anonymous. There are two references stating that Jimmy went to the narcotic farm in Lexington in 1953 for a seminar and to meet those uh, running the Addicts Anonymous meetings. One source is uh, Scott A's and a history talk at the San Diego Regional Convention in 1991. And the other in, is in the book, Every Addict's Friend, uh, that was written by Jimmy's daughter. Um, and this is certainly something that would be uh, interesting if others are able to track down additional, you know, primary document research um, into this, because that would also help inform uh, what that type of um, influence of Addicts Anonymous may have had on him and his efforts. We also see that the key plays a role, um, and Addicts Anonymous plays a role in other uh, newsletters. So, you know, they have articles in the AA Grapevine and February of 1948 and July of 1949. Uh, they appear in other prison-based newsletters, uh, such as the New Look, which was um, out of uh, Jackson, Michigan. Uh, we see it in multiple issues of a prison-based group uh, called the Al and their publication is the Alcanair uh, at the South Dakota State Penitentiary. And you, you would find them in the give and take page. And what's what's fascinating about this is that during the 50s and 60s, there's really this very robust network of prison-based groups that have newsletters that are being exchanged between the newsletters. So you see the key in Lexington, actually a little further down, you see the Signet from Lorton, Virginia. You have the Suburbanite, uh, which was published by the Rikers Island AA group. And you can see in here that the key is referenced along with a number of other uh, prison-based AA groups, something that seems to have been uh, lost and not practiced. I know that the Hole in the Wall group at the Oregon State Penitentiary does publish a newsletter. And it's just really phenomenal that they do that and that people from the community are actually able to subscribe to that newsletter. The last influence of Addicts Anonymous that I wanted to explore for a few minutes is the concept of hope and faith. And so in describing what Houston provided uh, him, Danny said that Houston inspired me to learn to hope and to have faith at long last. And this is again in the Saturday Evening Post article. Um, and uh, it actually may have been from um, a different book by um, Patrick in 1965 called Our Way of Life. But the important thing here is that this is being communicated that this is how Danny, again, who Danny died in 1956, how he's describing uh, the impact that Houston had upon him. And then in 1963, there's an issue of the key that gives a history of Addicts Anonymous. And it talks about, you know, mid February 47, four men drove many miles and God rode with them and talks about starting the that afternoon, a small group gathered and Addicts Anonymous was born. And then this line here that these four pioneers were members of Alcoholics Anonymous, Frankfort, Kentucky chapter. They were more than pioneers. They were pilgrims and crusaders. And this combines these all the kind of terms that we've been talking about. They brought with them the most powerful of all curatives. So you can think back to Dr. Tom going to Lexington for the cure those early you know, forms that were shown in this presentation, you know, were, were you cured at discharge? So they say that, that these four members of AA, that they brought the most powerful of all curatives, hope and faith. 
And so this is written in 63, you know, and it's very similar to the language that um, Danny used to describe what Houston provided for him. And so I, I think this is a really kind of important uh, concept to think about in terms of mutual aid uh, groups and fellowships and how they work and what individuals uh, with that lived experience can offer uh, to somebody who's, um, you know, still in addiction or unsure uh, what it looks like for them to try to, to find recovery. They also kind of end this, you know, history of Addicts Anonymous, you know, at this time in February 63, Addicts Anonymous movement is 16 years old. It's difficult to estimate how many people have been helped through this program. However, the membership receives letters daily from people who are now free of drugs and give all credit to the AA movement. So right there, you're seeing that this Addicts Anonymous group is, is permeating beyond the walls of the narcotic farm and, uh, you know, carrying out and, and impacting people in the community. At the beginning of the 17th year of our organization, we're still fortunate to have our original sponsor with us. He has taken many pains with this program and has done good for the addict that cannot be weighed by any scales on this earth, which is a, a beautifully written line. He claims that he derives more benefit than he gives by helping others. You have the undying gratitude of hundreds of us that you've helped, and Addicts Anonymous thanks you from the bottom of their hearts, Mr. Houston S. We see similar things along this around hope and faith. Uh, in some ways, in a letter to Dr. John, um, who you met earlier in the presentation, and this letter is from 1966, so this is seven years or so, or six and a half years after he had left the narcotic farm. And then Dr. Razor, who's the medical officer, says, I've been very impressed with the number of patients who have returned, particularly to participate in the AA, the Addicts Anonymous Group. I'm sure that there is great benefit to many of our patients here in the hospital. I hope you will continue to return as often as you can and we sincerely appreciate your support of the program of the hospital. And, you know, I, I think it's important uh, to kind of look at that, you know, that that's a very uh, proactive and responsible thing, I believe, for Dr. Razor to do to communicate the importance of these individuals with who are former uh, patients slash inmates at the narcotic farm who found recovery to come back and uh, to contribute. Narcotic Farm closed in 1975, becoming a federal pr prison. And again, uh, this underreported legacy is the creation of the Addicts Anonymous uh, group and its influence on recovery. As, as closing reflections, um, borrowing from today's Narcotics Anonymous literature, quote, we feel that our approach to the problem of addiction is completely realistic for the therapeutic value of one addict helping another is without parallel. And that was demonstrated and, and proven uh, by the formation of the Addicts Anonymous group and carried out over the years of its existence and its influence on other mutual aid groups. This presentation is again a reminder of the importance of the 12 traditions because um, those help assure the kind of survival of groups beyond the individuals that are involved at the time. Carrying the message of service a message of recovery and through service work, particularly linkage to those in hospitals and who are incarcerated. There are many people who this is really important uh, service work. And, you know, this presentation really speaks to uh, the benefits and the value of, of that type of work. And this is a special acknowledgement to those who take the time uh, to provide that service to, to those who can't come to a meeting in the community. And, I guess as a closing reflection, the importance of Houston S. Uh, Bob Stone, in his book, My Years with N.A., that was published in 1997, wrote uh, the following. And, and basically, the, the premise is that he saw six individuals who he considered heroes to Narcotics Anonymous, who, quote, these are the people who have made it possible for N.A. to have existed, grown, or moved in a positive direction. Without the efforts of these heroes, N.A. could have died or been much less than it is. The first hero is Houston S., who got the doctors at the U.S. Public Health Hospital at Lexington to try the AA concept with their patients. Houston came to the meeting every week until 1963 when he turned his duties over to another AA member. Many addicts, having found the message in this meeting, returned to their homes and joined AA. And joined AA. Many of them would eventually help NA when it started in their towns from coast to coast. From this came the New York Fellowship and also the foundation for NA in California. And just a last 
uh, kind of message that you know many continue to emulate uh, Houston's special form of service. And I like this photo. He was uh, drafted at World War One, so he served our country uh, and the world in one way, uh, and got into recovery and served uh, the world in a, another very uh, significant and meaningful way. For further resources, I'd just like to direct you to the Narcotic Farm documentary uh, from two, 2008 by Luke Walden and J.P. Olson. You can Google it and find it on Vimeo. And this was um, kind of a collaborative uh, project that also resulted in a book where Nancy Campbell was the primary author uh, called The Narcotic Farm, The Rise and Fall of America's First Prison for Drug Addicts. So you've got this book and uh, this documentary that are kind of these complementary um, resources. There's a 2021 edition to the Narcotic Farm uh, with uh, New Forward by Sam Quinones. And then a lot of references to Addicts Anonymous can be found in the Narcotics Anonymous Chronology Volume 1, the second edition, and it's posted at the um, chestnut.org under the William White Papers. Really appreciate you taking the time uh, and welcome uh, any feedback and um, research that, that you're inspired to do. Thank you.